this is a difficult video to shoot. It's about my friend Jeremy Kipnis. He died recently. He was 54 years old. And uh, I'm going to talk about my memories of, of Jeremy, which are many, and we had a lot of good times together. We met in the early 90s. But I'm going to start with the thing that he's maybe most famous for, his $6 million Kipnis Studio Standard Home Theater, which he was going to sell for $6 million. It did, the, the stuff in the home theater didn't cost $6 million. It was that Jeremy was going to design and build a, a home theater for very wealthy people, and that was going to be the $6 million cost. But it was adjustable, bigger, smaller, whatever. But we came to refer to it as the $6 million home theater. And I wrote this piece for Home Theater Magazine, which is now, now can be seen on the Sound and Vision website, which I will link to directly below this video. And there's a lot of more technical information of what was in the home theater. But I'm showing some pictures of what it was right now. So it was an 8.8 .8 channel home theater, but it actually had three center channel speakers. It had these gigantic Snell uh, THX reference tower speakers. It had 16 18-inch Snell subwoofers. It had, I lost count of how many Macintosh tube amplifiers were driving the system. There were Mark Levinson solid state amplifiers. There were Crown reference amplifiers. Lots and lots of gear. And this was in 2008, so it wouldn't be uh, state-of-the-art now, but I'll tell you what, in terms of power delivery, this thing, uh, nothing I've ever heard in my life t could touch this because it was effortless. You were surrounded. The speakers were basically in a circle around you, the speakers and the electronics. We're in a circle, in encircling the uh, viewers, uh, the listeners, and no matter how loud he played it, uh, it always sounded like it was coasting. It was just at ease all of the time. It was, <laughs> it was an event just to be in the room with all that stuff and how it all, you turn down the lights, put on a movie, and it just disappeared, and there you were immersed in this incredible sound that Jeremy worked so hard to put together and perfect and tweak and endlessly, endlessly, endlessly tweaking. This man was born to tweak. Bruce Springsteen was born to run. He, Jeremy Kipnis was born to tweak. I remember once, long before the, the Kipnis Studio Standard came into being, he, he got, a, I think it was a counterpoint amplifier. I have no idea which one. And I called him a day or so later. I said, so what do you think? How's it going? He said, oh, I haven't played, turned it on yet. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm cleaning the context. He was taking all the tubes out. I don't know. He was cleaning it. He was tweaking it without even listening to it. He was just obsessive about that. So he was working for Chesky Records basically as a mastering engineer, I believe, when he started. And in his mastering suite at Chesky in New York City, he had Sound Lab's A3 electrostatic speaker, these huge curved tower uh, electrostatic speakers. I don't know, I, I, that's probably pretty rare to find gigantic electrostatic speakers in a mastering suite, but that's the kind of thing that, Ches that Chesky would do and uh, Jeremy Kipnis would definitely be in favor of. But at sessions, he was the tweaker. He was cleaning co connections. And I remember on the, the gear, on the table where we had the analog to digital converter, he had all these cinder blocks like laid flat across the table just to mass load the table. He also was into mass loading the microphone. The microphone in those days was an AKG C24 tube mic. And it was on this huge, very heavy duty tripod and that tripod was sitting on Townsend uh, seismic sinks, these uh, isolation platforms. And then we would weight down the, the tripod with another 50 pounds of sandbag or something. I mean, these were all Jeremy's concoctions, I believe. It was all Jeremy's idea. Anyway, he was that crazy about pushing the limits. That's what Jeremy was all about. <laughs> I remember. When, when, Jer when Jeremy and I would just run into each other anywhere, he would walk up to me and he would say, so Steve, meaning, what's new? And uh, <laughs> he did that a thousand times. And he always had this huge smile on his face. He was a happy, happy guy. Um, so long after the Chesky uh, period for, for Jeremy, he started his own record company called Epiphany. 
and I happen to have an epiphany here. I'm having an epiphany as we speak. And this was, I believe, the very first title. I will link to Epiphany Records directly below this video in the description box. And um, his, his father, Igor Kipnis, very famous classical musician, played harpsichord, uh, is on that record. Uh, but he worked on a lot of Chesky sessions. He did this one, which is the last Peggy Lee recording. And uh, this was a trip, this session. Um, Full stories about this. Uh, these guys here, Jeremy was there for that. And I'll link to the Chesky records. This Fred Hirsch session. Fred Hirsch is a famous jazz uh, pianist. And this was, I believe, his first Chesky. And he was very intense. That's the main thing I remember about that session. Monty Alexander, famous Cuban uh, jazz musician. He, Jeremy was in, the, in there for that one. Tom Harrell, great jazz trumpet player. He was there for that. Now, Jeremy and I made two Chesky records on our own, as I recall. And the first one was this one, Vivaldi Four Seasons with period instruments. And uh, wow, this was an amazing session. And the, 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 the <laughs> working with musicians playing period instruments is kind of weird because they, they like to argue about what it's supposed to be. No, it's this tuning or it's this tuning. Uh, good times were had by all. Of course, his father was there. Igor was there kind of running the show with the musicians. But Jeremy and I were hunkered down. At, this was recorded in a church. And Jeremy and I were hunkered down in another part of the church listening and doing the recording part of the job. But uh, here's the thing. When we finished the session and we ran out of time, we had three of the four seasons done. It's kind of weird. We weren't going to release Vivaldi, the three seasons. So we had to reconvene this chamber group to get everybody back together sometime later to finish the fourth season. So, so there's that one. I, this is a great recording. I will link to that. And last but not least, this one, Igor Kipnis solo on uh, harpsichord doing Scarlatti also on period instruments and not literally 300 years old, but they're replicas of period instruments. I think they were all replicas of period instruments. But working with Jeremy and his father was also <laughs> just incredible because he was, he was not a, if you think that classical musicians are stiff and, no, his father Igor was a blast to be around. And Jeremy, I don't know, every time I think of Jeremy now, and oh, how can I end with, without talking about this dream? I had a dream about Jeremy a few days after he passed. And this is such a Jeremy dream. Because in the dream, he says to me, uh, oh, in the dream I'm saying to, to Jeremy, but Jeremy, you're dead. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm right here. This is very real. It was one of those hyper-realistic dreams. Your belief that I have passed away, that's a dream. That's the fantasy of yours. That's not real. I am perfectly alive. I'm right here in front of your face. And he did that So Steve thing. And he just, it, we were back together again. This was, it felt like the, like the early 90s again. We were, we did a lot, of, we had a lot of fun together, me and Jeremy. <laughs> and, well, he's not here anymore. It's kind of weird. So, Jeremy, if you're listening. So, Jeremy. So, Jeremy, if you're listening. So, Jeremy. I can't do it the way he did. Thank you for watching.